Corinthians 3, 10 through 14, on page 973 of the Pew Bibles. The righteous shall live by faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall, have, shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as we meet here today, let us be filled with your spirit. Help us to spread your love, peace, and faithfulness that we have found in loving you. Let us be thankful in you and worship you in all we do. Watch over our church family and our own families. Heal those that are ill and comfort those in need. Let us leave here today and be an example of your love to other people so they can feel your grace and see the grace of God in us and are filled with your Holy Spirit today. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. If you want to open up uh, to Galatians 4 uh, and verse 21. Galatians 4 and verse 21, I believe that's uh, page 973 also in your pew Bible. Paul is going to continue on as we move through the book of Galatians into application, certainly, of the gospel truths of our salvation. But chapters 5 and 6 really are the main application. He's going to make one more point. He's going to make one more allusion to salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Any other gospel is false. Any other gospel leads to self-worship. Any other gospel is works. Any other gospel is really self-deluded. Um, so I want to ask you a question today. And I'll do my best to give you enough information that by the end of the message you can answer that question and answer it honestly. Here's the question. Are you a child of God according to His promise? Or are you a child of the flesh subject to God's curse on the wicked? It's a clear-cut question with a clear-cut answer. And we're going to, when we get into Galatians 5, we're going to see the fruit of the Spirit that's demonstrated in people, and we'll know more about this, but I want you to ponder that. Who am I? Am I in God's kingdom as a beloved child or not? Um, the world needs to ask itself this question. But the world doesn't believe in God. They think he's a joke, he's a punchline. They bring up evil, which they've induced, and use that as a proof text against God. Not realizing that the very evil that they think a good God would never allow is a good God's judgment on the wicked. They are awash in his wrath and his mercy. He gives them breath and life. He gives them Christians to proclaim the gospel to them. He's made this wonderful creation that screams out, God made me! And they look at it and they go, oh, nothing plus nothing equaled something. All of a sudden there was this big bang. and They think order comes out of chaos by accident when the very science they lean on proves the opposite is true. <laughs> Order doesn't come out of chaos unless you apply energy. And 
enforce order on chaos, and then it comes. They are, they the wicked, they the non-believer, they the disbeliever, are surrounded by evidences of a good God who loves them. And they deny Him with every breath. Every human being is born under the curse of the law. Everyone. Every human. We're all born of the flesh. Cursed. Because we are unable to keep God's law. We fall con constantly short of His glory. Our moms were sinners. Our dads were sinners. We're the offspring of sinners. We are sinners. But some of us are saved, see? Some of us are saved because of what Gary just read. Some of us are saved because Christ took God's wrath against sin for us. Few, many are called, few are chosen, few are saved. But when I say few are saved, don't think there's like seven of us. When we read in Revelation, there are more folks than the eye can count. Oceans of saved people, of every tribe, tongue, nation, creed, color. Man, is heaven going to be great or what? Few are saved, but not two or three. It's few compared to the grand number of all people ever created. So we're going to look at four things today, and I want you to answer that question as best you can in your mind and in your heart. We're going to look at the law pretty quickly, and we're going to look at the child of the curse, and we're going to look at the child of the promise, and then we're going to glimpse into the end. What's your future? And I want you to pay attention, and I want you to not so much even hear my voice as to seek out the Holy Spirit and say, speak to me, tell me, tell me, affirm in me the things that are of God. And for you folks that are sitting in the seat of scoffers, someone drug you here today. You're not so much worried about the peace in eternity with God as you are in the peace in your living room with your wife or your husband. I want you to just take 35 minutes and listen. 35 minutes of your time. 35 minutes of your week. And if you hear the Holy Spirit, Today, do not harden your heart. Embrace the message and be saved. You don't need to go through what you're going to go through. It's not a given that you are going to spend an eternity suffering. It's not a given. Jesus will accept you. He will save you. He will wash you clean of your sin. He will make you as righteous as He is. All for the asking. All for the believing. I feel bad for the world. I do. They don't know. They're in the dark and they're blind. But we're the light, see? We're the salt. We're the voice. Let's take a look. First at the law, Galatians 4, 21 through 23. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Now, Paul's talking to the Galatians. Remember, they saved by grace, he thinks. But now all of a sudden they want to be religious again. Now all of a sudden they want to get circumcised. Now all of a sudden they want to observe the feast and the festivals and do all that stuff Leviticus says. And all of a sudden. They're running back to the law as if grace is of no value. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, and I know that by your actions, do you not listen to the law? It's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman of the flesh and one by a free woman of the Spirit. But the son, verse 23, and the slave was born according to the flesh while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. Paul is getting ready to take these Galatian, maybe they're believers, maybe they're not. He's getting ready to take them back to the place they want to go. 
He's going to take them back to the law. He goes, you want to be a Jew like the old Jews are? You want to get circumcised? You want to do all this stuff? You want to bring animal sacrifices to the temple? You want to do all this stuff? I'm going to take you back to the law that you love so much, and I'm going to show you what it says about salvation. What does the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's the law, that's the Pentateuch, it's the first five books of the Bible. What does the law and what do the prophets say about salvation? If the Galatians knew what the law, which they couldn't wait to get back to, and the prophets said about salvation, they would never want to go back to the law, which they can't wait to get back to. The law is good. But it curses us because we can't keep it. The law is there to say, you fall short. I did the speed limit sign where no cops ever pulled you over and said, thanks for doing the speed limit. Remember that story? right? But, but the law is there to show us where we break it. That's why the law is there. That's why God instilled it. He says, you've offended me. Why, Lord? Here's why. I'm giving you my Ten Commandments. You, you, you never keep them. You, you can't keep them. You've offended me in a million ways. You're supposed to worship me and me alone, and, and, you, and you refuse to do it, and you keep whoring after other gods, and you keep going out, and you you keep robbing your neighbor and you keep hating your brother and you, you keep doing all these things that testify against your love for me. Don't tell me you love me. Here's how you've offended me. And he's put the law out there. And all the Jews are like, yeah, we can't keep any of that. But they didn't think that. They refused to look at their own depravity. So, he's going to take them back to the law. And I want to just take a moment to put the Old Testament kind of in context to show you that it's useful. I had someone tell me once, Pastor, not here. Seriously, not here. It wasn't here. Uh, <laughs> why are we in the Old Testament? The deacon. I went, well, you know how your dog looks at you with his head cocked sideways? I went, well, what? He goes, why are we in the Old Testament? I just want to read the red letter. The red letters are important. And I said to him as kindly as I could muster, I said, don't you believe Jesus wrote all of the letters? Black and red? Is not he the author of salvation and the author of Scripture? Do you feel like you're wasting our time in the Old Testament? Like we're wasting our time? He's like, we just need to get tell people about salvation. Okay. Well, we're going to stay in the Old Testament because there's a purpose for the Old Testament. And, uh, but I want you to understand. What does the New Testament say about the Old Testament? Let's take a look. 1 Corinthians 10, 6, and 11. Paul wrote this. Now these things took place. He's talking about the Jews and what they went through in the Exodus. These things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end times has come. The Old Testament was recorded so that we, on whom the end times has come, and who just knows we're in the end times. Amen? Do you know? They were written for our benefit. You better read them. Better read them. Romans 15.4 For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have Hope. The Old Testament has meaning and purpose. It shows us what people of faith look like, and it shows us what unfaithful people look like. Amen? Have you read the Old Testament? It shows us what it looks like to walk with God. It shows us what it looks like to not walk with God. It shows us what someone who loves the Lord looks like. It shows us what someone who doesn't love the Lord looks like. But it also shows us the people that don't love the Lord, God is gracious and saves some of them. Amen? Prosper some of them. Gideon was a coward and a blasphemer. And God did wonderful things through Gideon. Gideon did nothing but gripe when God showed up. Well, yeah, yeah, you're God, right? Yeah, sure. What about this, all the torture we, we've been through as Israelites? And I don't know the smallest. We're the smallest tribe. Just on and on and on. And God's like, you done? And I got something for you to do, all right? So he's gracious, right? But that was written for us. Job was written for us. Can't you just wait, not wait to see Job and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was so thick-headed that you needed to go through all that so that I would learn about God's grace and mercy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He'll tell us it's all good. It was worth it. Because the things we endure here on earth that are bad, in our estimation, aren't even worthy of being compared to the glories that are here. 
All that suffering, psh, I barely remembered it until you brought it up. Thanks for rubbing salt in the wound, but I, I, I'm, I'm here in glory. You know? But the Old Testament Scriptures always point to Jesus Christ. And Romans 3, 21 through 22 says this, But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. That's what Scripture is for. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That is what the whole book is about. Are you a child of wrath? Or are you a child of the promise? Here's the question. Do you believe on Jesus Christ? That, that, that is the, the question that you have to answer. Depending on how you answer that question, we'll tell you immediately on which side of the tracks you're on. You don't have to look at your feelings. You don't even have to look that much at your behavior, though you do have to take it into account because if you truly love Christ, you're going to be more and more righteous, not less and less righteous. Right? Do you believe on Jesus? Man, he's made the hurdle low so that we can get over it. Amen, hasn't he? Paul just spoke to them of the covenant promise of salvation through grace as it was demonstrated in the slave woman. And, and he, he takes us back there. So we're going to go back there. And, and I want us to see this difference between the covenant and the law. Just like Paul's trying to point out to them. Let's go back. It's page 11 in your pew Bible. Keep your hand here. Don't, don't lose your place here. We're coming back. Uh, to Galatians 4. All right, but let's go back. Let's see, who's he talking about, this child of promise and the slave woman? Genesis 16.1. Genesis 16.1. Genesis is easy to find. Amen, saints? Where's Genesis? Right after the table of context. Contents. Or the preface. If you've got one of those cheater Bibles, those study Bibles, you probably got more in front of Genesis. But it, it's, it's the first book. Genesis 16. 1 through 4, and we're going to read about this. This is what Paul's alluding to. Genesis 16. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, I thought you say, I think it, I thought it was Sarah and Abraham. It is. Hang on. Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. It's it's no coincidence that she's an Egyptian, and I'll point that out here in a minute. And Sarah I said to Abraham, Behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Did God appreciate that move? Have you ever thought about that before? Did God, like, did God look down and go, now you're being inventive. That's what I'm talking about. You go ahead and solve your problems on your own. That, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. That's right. You do what, is that what God was saying? No. Does God cherish marriage because it's a picture of Jesus Christ in the church? Yeah. Even in the Old Testament when they were cheating on their wives, was that okay? No. Is that still adultery? Yes. Was this a good move? No. Was Abram all over it? Yes. All right. I got my wife's permission. Let's go have babies, you know? But did that please God? No, it didn't. But she's begging him. Go behold, now the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go into my servant. Be that she'll, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abraham had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. When we don't do things God's way, we bring all types of problems. I have so much trouble loving my wife adequately. Can you imagine having two, three, four, five? <laughs> God didn't intend it that way. That's why it doesn't work. One man, one woman for life. That's God's plan for marriage. <laughs> and Sarah said to Abraham, made the wrong... <laughs> Sarah blames Abraham. Sarah said to Abraham, may the wrong done to me be on you. <laughs> oh my goodness. I gave my servant to your embrace and when she saw that I conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. This is your fault. We defied God's word. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, let's look at verse 15. 
And Hagar bore Abraham, Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. We have to read the next one. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. Whew, mercy. 86. Why is Hagar an Egyptian? Why did God ordain that? Egypt represents sin and our enslavement to it. That's what Egypt represents in the Bible. And when God led Israel out of Egypt, that's a representation for us to see of God leading the elect, those He's saving, out of sin nature into the promised land which is glory. That's what all of that's recorded for. We just read it, right? That's for our, that's for our well-being. That's for us to understand. That's what that represents. Why is Hagar an Egyptian? Israel hasn't been enslaved to Egypt yet, but God's already telegraphing what He's getting ready to do. All of your troubles are going to come out of Egypt, meaning all of your troubles are going to come out of your sin nature and your slavery to sin, but I will deliver you if you just call upon my name and believe I can do it. Right here. They didn't know any of this stuff, though. All right, let's take a look over at Genesis 17. May have to turn a page, may not to. Genesis 17, 1. When Abram was 99. <laughs> 99 was 99 then, just like 99 is 99 now. Think about that. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. This is great. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of many nations. Abram gets two names. He's going to change Sarah's name and then I'll go back. All right? Verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you through their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Verse 8, And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all that the land of Canaan, and for an everlasting possession, I will be their God. All right, so that's the promise. And, and God's going to do that for Abram through Sarah. All right, so let's look at verse 15. Go on down there if you need to. If you need to turn the page, go ahead. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. Both those names mean princess. Think about that. We just came through the last teaching. We are royal heirs of the king through faith, right? Royal heirs. Sarah, princess. She gives the children of the promise are royal heirs. That's her name. Abram needed to change his name because he's a picture representation of both God the Father and God the Son. Exalted Father and Father of many nations. Amen. That's exciting stuff for me. I don't know about you. I'm a Bible geek. Maybe you're not, but I, I love that stuff. All right, ready? Verse 16, I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations and kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And he said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who's a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? Man, don't we sometimes just try and deny the promise of God? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Still wanting to do it his own way, amen, right? The way you've chosen God, that's a little bit hard. I'm 100, my wife's 90, I don't know about that. You've already given me a son. Why not just use him? And God said, I didn't decree that. Verse 19, God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him. Right? Well, that was God's plan. I promised you a kid. You didn't like it. You didn't want to wait. You went and did it your own way. Now you have another child who the promise is not coming through them. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes and I will make him into a great nation. That's the nation of the wicked. That's the nation under the law. The nation of Isaac, the children under the promise are a different nation. Folks, when you get saved, you are as different from a lost person as an elephant is from a flea. You have become a, a different thing. You have been born again. You have received a new 
nature. You are no longer that wicked sinner. You are now a, a child of the king. You were born again. You were redeemed. You no longer have anything really in common with them except this flesh wrapper that goes around the outside of us. Different covenant. Different people. Verse 21. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear you at this time next year. All right. Turn over if you need to to Genesis 21, verses 1 through 5. Genesis 21, verses 1 through 5. Don't worry. Just because we're reading through all the Scripture doesn't mean we're going to be here till 2 in the afternoon, okay? I, just, I know. You know me well enough to be worried, but don't. Don't. All right. Verses 1 through 5. The Lord visited Sarah. As, she, as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. Amen. Isn't that our God? Does what he says. Says what he's going to do. Keeps all his promises. Not one of his promises has ever fallen to the ground unfulfilled. Mercy, he's good. He's so good, you guys. Verse 2. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Decreed it. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Amen. All right, let's look at verses 8 through 12. Verse 8 now. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom he had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. Truer words have never been spoken. She spoke about a hate, but that's exactly God's intent. The blessings of the kingdom of God will not come to the wicked. They will not come. They will not inherit. If they stay wicked and refuse to repent, they will not inherit the good things of God for all of eternity. Only the born-again believer inherits any of that stuff. We have to change families. We have to move on over and get into the, the line of Isaac. But we only do that through faith. All right. Verse 11. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham. He didn't want to chase him away. He loved him, right? His, his child on account of his son. Uh, but God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac I shall, shall your offspring be named. Okay, all of that, the covenant, the promise, the slave woman, the free woman, the son born of the slave woman who's forced out, the, the son of the free woman who's blessed. Keep all of that in mind as we go back to Galatians now. Let's go back to Galatians 4. Let's look at verse 22 and, and now kind of wrangle it back in under context. For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave woman, uh, the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh. What's that mean? That was Abraham's plan. That was Sarah's plan. It wasn't God's plan, although he knew what was going to happen. It, that was not God's preferred way. That was not the way God was going to bring blessing. They couldn't wait for God to do it His way. They tried to do it their own way. That's wicked. That's disobedient. That's sons of the flesh. Born of the flesh. And if we go, which we're going to do, there's going to be a page turner today. Hope you guys are ready. Alright, keep your hand here. Let's go to uh, John chapter 1, verse 13. The Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 13. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, actually. The Gospel of John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. The Gospel of John. John writes this about Jesus. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave, seeth belief, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but God. That's the difference. That's the difference. We can't 
decree our way into salvation. We can't work our way into salvation. We can't earn our way into salvation. We, we don't warrant it. Anything we try, I don't care what it is, religion, being a good husband, being a good employee, be, I, whatever it is, if you're trying to get in good favor with God and you're using your own strength and your own means to do it, no matter how good they may seem, it is a dead man's gambit. It, 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 is, it is not working. It, it, you, you must be under the covenant. You must place your faith in Christ. You must be of the line of Isaac through faith. It's so clear cut. Now we can go back over to Galatians, I promise. The law always tells us salvation is only by grace through faith, which is accredited to us as perfect righteousness. This is God's promise to you. Back to the question. Have you availed yourself of God's promise? It's a rhetorical question. Think on it. Let's look at the child of the curse quickly here. The child of the curse. Uh, that's, a, that's Ishmael. It's a child of the slave woman. The child of the curse. The wicked today. And let's look at Galatians 4.24. I'm going to read this. Say something. Then I'm going to read 4.25 and say something. Okay, uh, Galatians 4.24. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. That means... Now Paul's telling you. If you just look up here for just a second. What's the best way to interpret the Old Testament? Is it to read the Old Testament passage, make up what you want it to say, and make it fit what you want it to say? Or can you let the New Testament interpret the Old Testament? The best way by far, you want to know what a passage means, see if it's referenced in the New Testament. The New Testament will tell you exactly what it means, and much of the Old Testament is referenced in the New. Look there first. These false teachers love to be in the Old Testament. Boy, they love being in the... Because they can take generalities of the Old Testament characters and put them on you and make you the hero of every story. You're Joshua. You're David. You can defeat your Jerichos. You can defeat your giants. You can do it all, baby, because you're the hero. Just have enough faith. Just give me enough money. Just watch me. Watch me do it. I'll show you how to do it. Buy my book. You know, all that stuff. The Old Testament's not about you as the hero. You're the Philistines. I hate to break it to you. You're the Philistines. Jesus is David. Jesus is Joshua. Jesus makes the walls fall down in your Jericho. Not you. You can't. You can't. You can't. Jesus is every hero in every story. Jesus is Samson. Right? In his good times. Because Samson has got some bad times. Who's read about Samson before in the Judges? Samson was knucklehead. Type A knucklehead. But boy, he was strong, wasn't he? And when he was working in the power of the Holy Spirit, he could do amazing things for God. And he just pulled that building down on the Philistines. That's what Jesus is doing. Sin hasn't bound Christ. He whooped sin's rear end. He's chained between those two pillars. They thought he had him chained between the two pillars. Just like Jesus was up on the cross. Right? Resurrected. He just flecked and pulled down the kingdom of Satan all in on itself and crushed every wicked person who refuses to bend the knee to Jesus Christ. It all fits. It's all right together. Man, don't, don't forsake the Old Testament. So, but Paul interprets it right here in verse 24. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One's from Mount Sinai. That's the law, right? We've been in the law forever. Bearing children for slavery. She's Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, so she's the law. She also corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. What does that mean? Well, let, let's read it one more time. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. All right, That is the law. That's trying to keep the law. That, that, that's trying to earn your way into glory. All right, that's, that's trusting in your own goodness, in your own power. But she's also something else. Let's continue reading. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar, verse 25. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Jerusalem was what? Jerusalem was religion. Jerusalem was uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they were all stored up in their temple waiting for Messiah to come when He had already come. They were, they were bound by the Old Testament law. They thought that they could be good enough. They thought that they could earn their way. They thought that they could give gifts to the poor and, and kind of get their way. They were trusting in men. They were trusting in their own power. They liked that power structure. It was everything except Christ. In fact, when Christ came to the Pharisees, what did they do? They killed Him. They lied on Him. And they killed Him. 
because they hated him. And that's exactly what God decreed would happen. Amen? And through their hate, and through their rage, and through their anger, and through their cheating, God had his way. Man, I, the devil doesn't stand a chance, y'all. He doesn't. He, does, he doesn't stand a chance. So that woman represents people that are enslaved to sin, represents the wicked. Her offspring are, are the wicked, those who are trying to earn it, those who are trusting in religion. They are, they are wicked, and they are perishing, and they are apart from Christ, and they are not in the kingdom, and they think they are. And It's very, very sad, but we have to tell them. We have to tell them. Let's look at the child of the promise now. Child of the promise. Galatians 4, verses 26 through 28. But the Jerusalem above is free. Amen. What did Jesus say to Pilate? My kingdom's not of this world. Amen. Isn't that what he said? If this, if this was my kingdom, my guys would be fighting. But this isn't my kingdom. You're going to kill me, and it's going to usher in my kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. That's it. That's the new Jerusalem. It's free. And she is our mother, right? For it's written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Remember Sarah? Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. Right? Because God's going to fulfill His promise miraculously through you. For the children of the desolate one will be more than uh, those of the one who has a husband. Now, let me break that down for you. More people are going to die lost than die saved. The children of the desolate one, the children of works, and the children of the flesh are far more in number than the few who find the narrow road and are saved. But we need to rejoice because our proclamation bears children of faith. Right? That's really what this is saying. Verse 28, Now you brothers like Isaac are children of the promise because you're faithful. All right? Who's our husband? Who's the bride of Christ? The church. Right? We have a husband. And I know you guys don't get nervous, guys. Okay? But, but we're, we're joined with Christ. We have a legacy. We are provided for. Husbands, listen, this is what we're supposed to be doing for our wives. We have a home. We are secure under the watch care of Christ. Nothing comes near us that He doesn't allow. Nothing sneaks past Him. Nothing can, no weapon formed against you can prosper. Right? Because Christ has His pinions over you just like a good husband should have over his wife and his family. Not on my watch. That's what Jesus said. Nothing will harm you on my watch. And my watch is eternal, and I never close my eyes. Amen? Isn't he great? So we have a husband. We have a watch care, a provider, a stronghold. Uh, so we don't have to worry. right? We're getting into glory. But those who don't have a husband bear lots of children. Lots of children. The, the, the wicked are just multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. If you're watching CNN for five minutes, you're seeing it. If you're watching the news for five minutes, you're seeing it. Uh, the, the aberrations... And, and, and the profanities of God's law that are embraced is normal. It just society's just spinning down the tubes, and we can watch it going. But rejoice, O barren one! You know, rejoice, for you not brothers like Isaac are children of the promise. Children of the promise. We're going to go to the exciting book now here for just a minute, okay? Revelation twenty-one, one through four. It's on page 1041 of your pew Bibles. This year. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. This is the promise. The child of God's promise. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. That's the Jerusalem that Paul just described to the Galatians. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and He will dwell with them and they will be His people and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Is He a good husband or what? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away, never to return again. Amen. Aren't you glad? Never to return again. 
Jesus isn't one of those trick husbands, you know, where you like get married for like a year, it's good. And then they show their true colors and it gets real sour real quick. No, no, no. No. Let's look at verse 10 of, of chapter 21. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And then verses 22 through 27 finally. I saw no temple in the city. Its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Amen. Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament temple. Verse 23. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. You know, on this earth, we can't look at the sun. Have you thought of that? It's this big fiery ball in the center of our universe that's up there, and it's beautiful, and it casts light on everything, but we can't look at it, because why? What happens to anyone if you look at the sun for just too long? It burns your eyes, you go blind, right? Not in glory. Not in glory. We're going to do nothing but stare at the sun. They're going to say, stare at the sun, because now if they tell you stare at the sun, you're like, you can't do that. Science says we can't do that, and I'll be blind, and then you know I'll have a cup and the whole, the whole thing, right? But now, in, in heaven, we're going to be staring at the sun. It's, it's going to be beautiful. <sighs> And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on, for the glory of God gives it its light. Shekinah glory, you guys. And the lamp is the lamb. As he wanders around in the city, because he's flesh, you know, as he wanders around in the city, rubbing shoulders with us, talking with us, and being with us, oh my goodness, it's just going to be so awesome. He, he's, just, he's the light. Verse 24, by its light will all nations walk. Is God good or what? All nations. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing here, listen, that's the children of the promise. Here's verse 27. These are the children of the slave woman. Verse 20. But nothing unclean will ever enter it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. Let's look at this. Verse 27. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. The wicked do detestable false things. The wicked lie. The wicked cheat. The wicked lust. The wicked do all of these things. But there's a group of people, the children of the promise, that are going to get into heaven. Are we getting into heaven because we don't lie? Because we don't cheat? Because we don't lust? No, no. Look. There's more words. Look. But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. Your conduct will send you to hell. But who gets to heaven? Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Not a thing to do with your performance. You get into glory because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the criteria. Again, are you a child of the curse? Or are you a child of the promise? That's the question. Do you trust Christ, y'all? Do you trust Christ? That's the question. All right. Last time we're turning pages, we're going to go back to Galatians 4. We'll be in verse 29 in a minute. So has the, question, the answer to that question started to take shape? Are you starting to be affirmed, I'm in one camp or the other? I hope so. Because let's look at the end, Galatians 4, 29-31. But just at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So also it is now. Okay? The end times, the wicked will persecute the church. And as you read through Revelation, that's going to happen. The wicked one, Ishmael, thinks they own it all. Don't they? They value wealth, things of the earth. Even Satan got caught up in it. What did Satan say to Jesus in the desert? If you worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus is like, I don't want that trash. That's not my kingdom, fool. Who, who, who do you think you're talking to? The Lord God only will you serve. Boy, I'm not serving you. I don't want this. Guess what? I've seen the end. I know what I'm doing with this when I come back. It's all going to be destroyed with fire, and I'm going to build a new one, a perfect one. That's my kingdom, not this kingdom. Second, you're a liar anyway. You don't have the authority to give it to me. Amen. All right. Oh, Satan. All right. But just as, verse 29, but just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh 
persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. That, remember when uh, Hagar was laughing? Uh, Ishmael was laughing and Sarah saw him laughing. That, that's what this is talking about. Sarah was rejoicing over the birth of Isaac and, and Ishmael was over there. I was the firstborn. I'm getting the inheritance. And, she, and she's like, cast that woman out, right? Cast it. Verse 30, but what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. The lost may think they own it all, but when Jesus comes back in judgment, they're going to have a sad day waiting for them when they stand before that great white throne. And he's like, I don't, I don't know you. You're guilty. Be gone. And they're cast into hell. That's the future for the wicked. The only difference between the wicked and the redeemed is that we're redeemed. The only difference between the wicked and the saved is Jesus. We look just like them, and we've talked about that. We look just like them so often, but we're not them. We have a renewed spirit. We are a different creature. Man, it's so good. Cast out the slave woman and her son. Sin and sinners will be cast into hell. For the son of the slave woman will not inherit with the son of the free woman. Verse 31, here it is. So brothers, sisters, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. My question for you is the question that we started with. Are you a child of the promise? Or are you a child of the curse? You can do it at any time. But now, in this moment, we're going to have a time of decision. If you realize, I've never trusted Jesus. I don't know Him. But I want Him to save me. I trust that He will. I trust in His blood and His blood alone. I've heard enough from Pastor Tim. I, I get it. I, I, I see it. I, I, I need to be redeemed. I need to be forgiven. I need to be recreated in the, in the image of Christ. And, and I want that. If that's you, please come. If you have questions about it, please come ask. I'll talk to you. If the line's a mile long, other deacons and other people that know Christ will come up and talk to you and we'll get to the bottom of this thing. Do you want Christ? Do you, Christ, do you know Christ? If you have a burden that you want to lay on the altar, any decision that you need to make, now is the time. Now is the time. Can everyone stand? Can I have the players come?